Good afternoon. I'd like to uh, call to order the February meeting of the Johnson County Community College Board of Trustees meeting. Would you please uh, stand and join me for the pledge and then remain standing following the pledge for a moment. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We're all aware of the uh, travesty that happened in uh, Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. Uh, 17 students went to school yesterday and 17 families didn't have them come home is the latest number that I have heard. So I would appreciate it if we'd have a moment of silence for the families and victims of Douglas High School. Thank you very much. Next item is the roll call and recognition of visitors. Ms. Schlees. This evening's visitors include Dick Carter, Jared Foster, Dennis Batliner, Cheryl Batliner, Julie Sovereign, Olivia Sovereign, Blake Coger, Justin Wrigley, Mike Wallace, Nick Cole, Josh Sovereign, Melody Rail, Val Ball, and Roberta Eveslage. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the open forum, and the open forum is a section of the board agenda is a time for members of the community to provide comments to the board. There will be one open forum period during each regularly scheduled board meeting. Comments are limited to five minutes unless a significant number of people plan to speak. In that instance, the chair may limit a person's comments to less than five minutes. In order to be recognized, individuals must register at the door at each board meeting prior to the open forum agenda item. When addressing the board, registered speakers are asked to remain at the podium. We should be respectful and civil and are encouraged to address individual personnel or student matters uh, directly with the appropriate college department. As a practice, the college does not respond in this setting when the matter concerns personnel or student issues or matters that are being addressed through our established grievance or suggested suggestion processes or are otherwise a subject of review by the college or board. Tonight we have nine registered speakers. Uh, seven of them, I believe, uh, have indicated they would like to speak to the track um, issue. Uh, as a result of having seven in that category, I'm going to limit your comments to four minutes tonight rather than five. Uh, I apologize if I didn't get you in the order of registration. Uh, but I'll take them as I have them. And the first is uh, Dennis Batliner. So again, if you would uh, state your name and your address and limit your remarks to four minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Dennis Batliner, 10,000 Perry Drive, Overland Park, Kansas, 66212. As we have been forced to dig deeper into the details behind the decision to rid the college of a successful track and cross country program, with a 32-year history. We have been examining documents obtained through the Kansas Open Re Records Request. The more we learn from these documents about this decision, the less it makes sense. Though it has been claimed that the general public has known about this decision since March, the fact is we really first heard about it on December of 2017 when KSHB TV shined a spotlight on the issue. One rationale given at that time was that the Jayhawk Conference rule change, which makes it optional for schools in the Jayhawk Conference to offer more scholarship funding to student athletes, including room and board. But let us make no mistake, on October 20th of 2016, JCCC voted in favor of this change. And let the record be clear to the public, this rule change was already being used as a rationale on March 3rd of 2017, before the change was permanently ratified on April 20th of 2017. It was ratified then with a vote of 12 to 7, with JCCC again voting in favor. What reason might have been provided if just three more schools had voted no instead of yes? Regardless, the change does not require additional spending to remain competitive. It is well known by those throughout the NJCAA 
that JCCC athletic programs are already amongst the most heavily funded in the nation. Additionally, other Jayhawk conference schools are on record they will remain competitive without additional funding. Certainly, JCCC, which is already well funded, can do the same. JCC has typically had around 55 student athletes in the programs, not the 37 athletes that were mentioned at last month's meeting, which resulted because of the programs being cut. The programs were just cut, not because of a rule change, not because of required funding increases. So why? It's becoming apparent this is a leadership and management issue where a few people made an administrative decision with no public input and were then forced to make post hoc justifications that don't make any sense. This is the largest community college in Kansas with a $150 million budget that's spending $103 million on new facilities, $50 million of which indebts all of Johnson County citizens for 20 years, and that happened without a public vote. How can JCCC receive an additional 8% in property tax revenue this year, but they can't afford to running programs with 32 his year histories that have been established and supported by past administrations, board members, and tax revenue over the 50 year history of the college? When putting all of this together, it just does not make sense to me that the individuals involved in this decision could not come up with a way to keep these programs in place for current and future student athletes. This is a terrible way to go into JCCC's 50th anniversary year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Batliner. Next is uh, Olivia Sovereign. Olivia Sovereign, 8143, Acuff Lane, Lenexa, Kansas, 66215. Hello, I'm a junior at St. Thomas Aquinas High School and I run cross country and track. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I will be speaking on behalf of the destruction of the beloved track here at Johnson County Community College. As a member of St. Thomas Aquinas track and cross country teams, I have spent hundreds of hours at the JCCC track alongside my entire team. As you know, my school pays for our use of the track and we have an active interest in keeping it around. Nowhere else will you find a team so unbelievably dedicated to a sport. I attended the January meeting of trustees where it was mentioned that there was a lack of high caliber athletes training on your track, but I could not disagree more. Um, I personally have spent thousands of hours running workouts here over the past six years and that number continues to grow. I'm a back-to-back -back cross country 5A Kansas individual state champion and a 1600 meter runner up at the track and field 5A Kansas state meet. I was named the All Metro Kansas runner of the year and Kansas girls cross country Gatorade player of the year. My teammate, Ethan Marshall, also a junior, was the 2017 cross country 5A Kansas individual state champion. He was named All Metro, All Metro Kansas runner of the year and Kansas boys cross country Gatorade player of the year. This is the first time in state history that a boy and girl from the same high school were named the Gatorade players of the year for cross country and this is where we train. Over the last three years, our track team has had 5A individual state champions for track and field in the 3200 meter, 1600 meter, 110 meter and 300 meter hurdles, the 100 meter dash and long jump. Some of the best school, high school athletes in the state use this track as a base for our training to get to the next level. It could be argued that there is not another track in the state of Kansas that reaches the same level of high caliber talent. A number of students at St. Thomas Aquinas are enrolled here at JCCC through the College Now program, including a sizable amount of athletes from our track team. As it was mentioned in the January meeting, the students of JCCC were asked about the track and a considerable amount of them agreed that it didn't matter what happened to it. But it would seem that the high school students simultaneously enrolled here were not given a say in the matter. 
So if the students are using it, then why tear it down? What I propose is to leave the track as is. The school would be spared the expense of getting rid of it, and it would still be open for the public to use. If the school wanted to bring the track program back in years to come, it would still be an option without building a brand new facility. If there are already plans for the land currently held by the track, there is a tremendous amount of open green space on the east side of the campus that could be used as a replacement. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here today about something I feel very strongly about. I hope you consider what I have said today and take to heart the importance of this track to the community of Johnson County. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hoffman. Appreciate it. Jared Foster. My name is Jared Foster, 914 Southwest Over Road, Belton, Missouri. I'm the head track and field coach at Ray Peck High School. Um, so my history, I, I ran track here um, out, of, out of high school. I was a kid that um, I got good grades, but I'm dyslexic and I had to work for everything I had. Um, I was offered more football scholarships and I came to the school for, um, and took a tour and was not offered money, but I saw what you guys had to act, um, offer me academically. and. I had a lot of assistance in the learning center, people reading tests to me. Now I'm a teacher, a coach, finished my specialist at Arkansas State and plan on pursuing my doctorate. So it hits a little hard that I went from maybe not going to college to where I am today. I've currently sent close to a dozen athletes to school here. Many of those are athletes and kids that I've taught that had the same background that I had and I saw the opportunities they had here. They've ranged from state champions to kids that didn't even make it to state but came here and became all Americans here. Um, I now coach with many of those that are around in the Kansas City area. One of the, one of the other coaches I coach with is a graduate here. Um, he, had, he had to do something for his doctorate tonight and he, he shared the same story and said, if it wasn't, for the opportunities I had here and getting the invite there, I wasn't going to college. No one else called me. Um, I've, I just can't say enough about who I am today and where I came from, came from this. Um, when I went on, I went on to another, a four-year university from here and I, had to, and I realized how much I was missing because of the opportunities this school has compared to other schools out there. Um, this is the second time I spoke on a forum um, the last time I spoke on the forum, Johnson County asked me to speak to a group of teachers that um, were working with kids with um, disabilities to try to, to give them advice to tell them what options are out there for, for kids that may have struggled. Um, the same way to let them know that there's, there's options and, and college can be for you. And so speaking um, on that panel, I, I respected it as much as you guys were, but there was 100 teachers there. So I was a little nervous, but then after that, I ended up talking to teachers, and then that's some of what drew me into education. But through talking to that, I've now spoken to close to 100 different high schools and went and talked to those kids and let them know there's options out there. You can get help. You just got to be willing to ask and look for it. And this is a place that if I didn't come here to tour and look at the track, I would not have seen, seen or discovered everything you guys had to offer. And I thank you for that, but I just ask that you reconsider this because you do touch a lot of lives. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Appreciate it. Blake Coger. All right, uh, Blake Coger, 24853 West 148th Court, Olathe, Kansas. Um, Blake Coger, appreciate the opportunity to come up here and speak with you all again um, about this issue. So far, we've heard some amazing stories tonight. I'm, I'm really glad uh, people chose to, to join us and, and speak on this cause because it, it's, it really is important, and I, and I hope that, that that's eventually going to get across to everyone. So um, it's not that we didn't start this process earlier. We did. Um, it, you know, we've been talking for over a month now with you all. Brian reached out you know, at, at the beginning of last spring, and, and we kind of didn't get a lot of response. We were kind of shut down. So I think what we really needed was some, um, some momentum. I think we needed to show the support. We needed to show 
those around us that, that support this 32-year-old program. It's important to a lot of us. Um, you know, we've had over 1,000 people indicate that they're gonna join us on the Walk the Track event on March 10th, um, and we'll be getting many more over the next couple of weeks. So one of the things I think we need to make sure that we're clear on is that we support the efforts of the college to adjust programs, uh, to review and adjust programs, facilities, staffing, and, and much more. That's, that's not in dispute. That's obviously part of your purview, especially when you have a couple of things. One, detailed and extensive evaluations of those programs with the data to back it up. And two, a focus on the larger community impact that those programs have as it relates to challenges of today and tomorrow. Um, so, so with that, I, I, I wish that every dollar you spent here at the college was 100% traceable and tied directly back to some return on investment. Um, realize ROIs can be hard to track. Uh, there's a lot of intangibles. You can't analyze everything immediately up front and then see the later return on that investment. I get it, totally understand. I am curious as an as a interested party in this track um, effort, as well as a Johnson County taxpayer, how we're evaluating the $103 million master facilities plan. How directly do those investments improve the college, um, grow enrollment numbers that you said have stagnated for over 10 years. How does that significant investment really put the college's best foot forward? Um, every, I wish every decision could be analyzed uh, to that detail and shared with the public without us having to go to extreme efforts to find that. Um, so, you know, some of those are easy, easier to identify. I realize, understand that, but would like to see um, that as it relates to the track and field program. Along those lines, I'm sure many of you are aware um, of, of that decision and the data behind it, so I, I would ask that you share it with us. Um, the case of the 32-year-old program that you chose to cut, I think the, the benefits far outweigh the investment. I think if we, if we look past, um, you know, it's not, it's not going to provide a return. None of, none of our athletics provide return here. But you look at the community impact, you look at the impact of lives that you've he heard here today before on our website. Um, the sport is uniquely able to provide these benefits, and the school's uniquely positioned to be an innovator in that sport. Brian Batliner, part of our group, recently wrote a fantastic article on our website about the, the vision that this program could have, its, its community impact, um, if we had the support that it deserves. And, and we, we accept blame on some of that, too. We should have been supporting the program earlier than now. Um, but, you know, the fact of the matter is, is we're, we're here now. So, um, I, I, this, this innovation, innovative history that Brian mentioned isn't unique to Johnson County. Um, Orville Gregory and Barbara Gill have a unique history at this school. Orville created the first NCAA, NJCAA women's basketball tournament here at Johnson County and was an athletic director for many years. By the time he left, he had 10 national caliber programs. Um, he understood the importance of quality physical education. Barbara Gill created the, the um, wellness, the fitness and wellness program in the JCCC curriculum. Despite the odds being stacked against her in August of 1987, you guys opened the, the college's fitness center. Lincoln, so, I could ask you to sum up. Yep, four yep. So all of, these, all of these innovative minds is, is what we need today, this, this innovative thought leadership. So I'll close by asking you that the elected officials in this room, that you work with us, join us tonight in this innovative spirit. Help us come to a solution to this problem to save this historic program and, and innovate other programs in the best interest of the community. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Coger. If I remember in January, you came and said that you were kind of nervous getting up in front of I a am, group it, to speak. It's nice, it's and nice you're, getting, uh, you're getting really good at it. <laughs> Mike Wallace. Hi, my name is Mike Wallace. I live at 10318 Long Street, Overland Park, 66215. I am the uh, head track and field coach at Olathe East High School. I actually interviewed for the Johnson County job when you gave it to Dave Burgess. I think you probably made a pretty good choice. Um, his, his, uh, his credentials are outstanding. I would be probably considered the elder statesman of track and field. Obviously, look at my head. Track and field statesman in Johnson County. I've been a head coach for 38 years. I've been coaching track and field 42 years. Um, the number of kids that we send, you know, I have nothing prepared, so this is just all coming from the heart. Of the number of kids that we have sent to Johnson County to participate in track and field, I, I can't even give you the numbers. We had an athletic signing today at Olathe East. We had 21 student athletes sign. This is the first time I can remember 
and I don't know how many years we had nobody commit to Johnson County for track and field. I had, I had visited with two of my children the other day. Both of them's GPAs are not good. Both of them's homes lives are not outstanding. Their options are junior college and the military. Those are their two options. With the program, and I said, well, you may have to look elsewhere. They want to come to Johnson County to run track and field. And whether they would be all Americans, whether they'd be contributors, you know, they're, they're probably not gonna have, they may not have that opportunity. I think that's a sad state of affairs because these are wonderful kids. And we've had, new, again, numerous kids over the years come here and participate in track and field. You know, we have actually, we have a nice facility at Olathe East. We have a very, very nice track. We have actually come and used the facility here as a state prep meet because your track is very similar to what we see at Wichita State. And the folks, the head coaches prior um, have been kind enough. We, we call and, and Carl was nice enough to let us come up here and, and, and use the facility. Um, I, I hate to see it go. I really do. Um, so many positives, so many good things come from, from athletics and, and track and field. And, and you know, we have 150 kids out for track and field, between 150 and 160 kids out for track and field at Olathe East. It is a good sport. It's a great program. And I would sure, sure like to see whatever could happen to make sure that this tradition continues at, at Johnson County. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walls. Appreciate your time. Nick Cole. <clears throat> uh, Nick Cole, 12232 Connell Drive, Overland Park. Um, so for the second month now, I'm here as part of the large contingent of what you now see are passionate individuals that make up the Save JCC Track initiative. Um, tonight, my focus is solely on the issue of student fees and scholarships for the student athletes. Since that was the number one reason cited for cutting the track and cross country programs, provided by the board and president at last month's meeting, uh, as well as in some open record documents that we obtained uh, through the school. So it's well known through the junior college world that uh, Mr. Batliner had mentioned that these programs are very, very well funded. Um, I'd like to provide an example. Maricopa Community College District down in Phoenix, Arizona, which is a system of nine community colleges that it supports, uh, of multiple athletic programs in an urban core similar to the one we have here, actually larger, four and a half million in Phoenix, about two million in Kansas City. Um, Johnson County is in a unique position because we are the only major community college still, if you do choose to reverse the decision, with a track and cross country program that can reach that two million metropolitan area. Um, here we have nine out of four and a half million. So there's a huge recruiting edge when it comes to recruiting from your home base that, that we have here. Um, but comparing track programs is difficult and cross country programs because over the last three decades, this school and past administrations have spent numerous hours, numerous dollars, building out facilities and, and capabilities that we have here an indoor and outdoor track facility and a cross-country course all on campus. Um, no other school has that that we've ever come across. No other junior college in this country has that. And I mentioned that last month. Um, so let's compare like programs. The women's soccer program at uh, Paradise Valley Community College, which is part of the Maricopa District, operates at a budget of $28,000. So that includes scholarships for the year, team travel for the year, equipment for the year, and coaching stipends for the year. So let that sink in, $28,000 for their women's soccer team. By comparison, Johnson County Community College's budget is $67,000 for their women's soccer team, but that's scholarships alone. That doesn't include coaches' salaries, that doesn't include team travel, that doesn't include equ equipment for the year, none of it. So. It's pretty easy to see that Mr. Batliner's point is validated in the exuberant amount of money that this college funds its athletic programs. So when you have coaches at Johnson County coming to administrators to say they can't compete without more scholarship money 
and the administration in turn comes to the board and says, we have to cut track and cross country because we don't have enough scholarship money, there is a simple and reasonable response to this request. You could have said no. Find a way. Others clearly are. Keeping a track and cross country program in place may not boost an administrator or board member's resume the same way erecting shiny new buildings will, and the facilities master plan has a lot of those. Uh, but what point at, but what, at what point did we decide it's okay to do what is wrong for the community in taking away opportunities from the people you are here to serve simply for the career benefit of a very small group of individuals? We will continue to fight this decision with the backing of enough people to make change over time until community opportunity is restored and those who are trying to remove these opportunities are no longer in a position to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cole. And Justin Wrigley. Justin Wrigley, 9227 Lichtenauer Drive, Lenexa, Kansas, 66219. And I just want to speak to the, um, the idea of how much I think it's being underestimated the impact that a track facility can have on the community uh, here in Johnson County. Uh, other than your own track and field coaches at Johnson County Community College, I can assure you that I have spent uh, more time than anybody else on that track. I'm the head track and field coach and cross-country coach at St. Thomas Aquinas and have uh, been so for 12 years. And I've spent a lot of time there training kids like Olivia and, and others. And in that time, it's not just about uh, the relationship between St. Thomas Aquinas and Johnson County Community College in, in renting that facility for our, our team to practice. Uh, it's what I've seen during that time. Obviously, it's had a great impact on our athletes. That, that, that part's easy to figure out. But uh, more so than winning races or winning championships, um, the impact that track and field can have on so many lives. It, it's a sport that, as you can see, brings people together. Uh, it's a lifestyle sport. It's a healthy sport. And I've over the years watched numerous youth teams come and go and use that as a practice facility. Um, and while we're at practice, we sometimes, even though we're renting the facility, members of the community want to come down and work out. And we never run them off, even though we have a contract saying it's our time on the track, because it's fabulous to have retired men lacing up their spikes and working on the 100-meter dash for, <laughs> for the health of it. Um, we see that. We see people fresh out of college entering the career force that want to stay fit and maybe get ready for the corporate challenge. But people from the community, I assure you, are on a regular basis on that track working out and bettering their lives and their health and their fitness. And, uh, and I've seen it from very small children uh, to retired old men and women. And uh, whether it's walking um, or running or competing or whatever, there's always people from the community down on that track. And it's, uh, they're going to lose that. And many, many members of the community are going to lose that opportunity. And uh, so are the opportunity for lots of kids like Olivia who get involved in youth track at an early age, uh, who then grow up to live healthy, productive lives and come to what most teenagers would probably find a boring board meeting. Uh, a person like Olivia is here taking an interest in her community and in how it affects other people. And uh, that's what you run the risk of losing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wrigley. Appreciate it. Chris Russell. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, members of the faculty and administration, community, teachers, other students. I'm a student here. In school, I was a track runner. When I ran cross country at the Air Force Academy, my weight was 137 pounds. Now I'm a public health nutritionist, a public health planner, I know what people die of of the U.S. in the U.S. and what we spend on health in the medicine in the U.S. I should say not on health, on medicine in the U.S. We spend about eleven thousand dollars per capita per year on medicine. The remedy to spending so much money is investing in health. 
running, it's hard to gain, be overweight. And obesity is a major cause of diabetes, heart disease, other atherosclerosis, other dysfunctions. Besides it's being good for athletes, besides it's being good for programs, it's good for the community. It's a way of life. And I can't imagine, given what our situation in the world is, we're spending more on medicine than any country in the world. Given that what our situation is, we need lifestyle change, and you remove facilities, and lifestyle change goes away. Um, one other concern related to that is we've got a great gym and great recreation facilities here. As a student, I can't use them unless I take a course. So when I went to KU this morning, I, could, I went to the rec center and I spent 30 minutes before classes getting my body and mind in shape, but at JCCC, I have to take a special course in order to be able to use the gym. But exercise before class, exercise aerobics with class, increases intellectual performance, increases test scores. To have a great academic program, we also need to invest in great educational facilities. With the gym, a minor concern is I can get almost any, go to almost any public gym in the country for free as a Medicare Plan C participant, but I can't use the facility here. I think it would be possible, and I know it's been tried, but I think it would be possible to enroll us in Medicare Plan C so at least the stu senior, student, uh, senior citizens who are students could use the facilities and you'd get automatic reimbursement for the, from the federal government. Another concern is internships. My daughter graduated number one student in chemical engineering from Georgia Tech, but she had not done an internship. And as a number one engineering student from the number five <coughs> engineering program in the country, she could not get a job. Here, we don't have internships built into our academic programs, and the international students can't even participate in them because of their work status. I'm over my time, but that is a concern, and I would like to see the college address it. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate Thank it very you. much. Teresa Sahar. Hi, my name is my name is Teresa Sahar. I'm at 13215 South Lakeshore Drive in Olathe, Kansas. And I'm here to talk about school safety. I have a student who goes here and he takes um, a number of different different classes, including political science and sociology classes. And we feel that the current safety situation is not conducive to free speech at the college. I would like to see Johnson County Community College be a beacon of safety in the educational system of the United States. I would like to see this college lead the way in school safety and student safety. So um, I know that we need to make some changes. I feel like every day when I send my son here, he is possibly in danger, especially if ex he expresses his political views in class. And so I would like to see some improvements in school safety, and I think this is a very valid concern considering the happenings yesterday. We don't want to be in the news as a junior college where something horrific has happened, and I would like to see my son come home from school, which he loves this school. He's having a wonderful time here, 
but I want him to come home safe every single day exactly as you want your children to come home. So I would like to see some safety improvements such as being able to uh, be um, issued a bulletproof vest possibly to be purchased in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the bookstore along with your books and your calculators. We've already purchased a number of bulletproof backpack inserts in order to make my son feel safer coming here. So I would like to see some additional safety procedures put in place for all of our students. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Uh, I, I guess a comment. I, I really appreciate all of you being here. Uh, we had seven people speak on the track issue. We've had a number of you speak on the track issue in January. Uh, as we've indicated, this is really not a forum to engage in debate and interact. And I would again ask you to, uh, we'll take this information as trustees and work with related staff, but ask you to visit with the staff regarding that. Chris, I, my only comment about the usage, I belong to an early morning Bible study, and there are about a half a dozen, maybe four people that have come up to me and said, thank you for allowing us to be at the college and work out early in the morning. So I'm assuming that's a communication issue when you say you're not allowed to be in there to work out. So I, again, would ask you to meet with staff, and the trees are the same. I, I appreciate your remarks. We're all concerned about safety these days. Um, Concerned about where it'll be tomorrow, but I, uh, I believe that our training program, or the ALICE program that was referred to at the beginning of this meeting, and all the training that our staff has gone through uh, is, is one of the best in the country. But again, I would encourage you to meet with our staff uh, regarding, regarding that issue. With that, I'm going to close the open forum and move to awards and recognitions. I'd like to uh, report refer this portion of the meeting to Dr. Weber. Yeah, we have two awards and recognitions tonight. Um, we have uh, two recipients and I... Yeah, yeah. Um, Two recipients, interestingly enough, they're both in our, in our fair services area, and so we're going to kind of bang them together. And I'll give a qu quick background here. So, Carol, Linda, if you two want to come on up. Um, our career service has under, uh, gone a little bit of a facelift in the last couple of years, and I think the awards that we're going to recognize tonight will be able to demonstrate a little bit of that. Our first recipient is Carol Gard, and Carol has been recognized by the Kansas Association of Colleges and Employers. Um, she, she's, the, uh, she's the treasurer for the association, and she has been recognized uh, as the her, the member of the year, the job that she does with them is she ensures all the bills are paid. She's our treasurer, so all registrations process. But she's being recognized uh, by the Kansas Association of Colleges and Employers uh, for their member of the year. So Carol, mm -hmm. thanks for your service to Case. Thank you. And our other person up here tonight is, is a fun, uh, it, it, it's a demonstration of collaboration and what we can do collectively. Uh, Linda Dubar is up here and been with the college for a couple of years, but in, to her, in your role about a year or so, right? Yes, uh, right. Okay, and so um, what, she, what she, Linda is up here, she's rec been recognized on behalf of uh, joint effort by Kansas Board of Regents. Uh, they have what they call the Employer Engagement Initiative, and we are recognized as a champion supporter level um, through our, our local employer, three local employers in an internship program that we have with them, computer impressions, LDK lawn service, as well as integrity roofing. Um, we've had students go through there. Some of them have been hired by those internship sites. And uh, just as a good example, Linda is, is receiving or, or accepting the award this evening, but we have a number of folks, particularly some faculty in the programs, that uh, I think each of these uh, students were recognized with web development. And so we appreciate the faculty in web development who have worked with Linda to make sure that our students do get some placements and some careers. So congratulations, Linda. Thank you. I would just say to both of you that thank you very much on behalf of the trustees in the college. Uh, there are a lot of people like you that work hard every day to support a system, to support an organization. And your recognition tonight uh, really uh, uh, 
demonstrates the hard work you put in each and every day. So thank you both very, very much, and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Next item is uh, the Student Senate Report. Ms. Bukema, if I said that correctly. I hope I didn't mess up the Ms. part too much. So thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Uh, my name is Helen Bukema, and I am the Student Senate President. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today on behalf of the Student Senate. On January 9th, a uh, student senator had a retreat where we discussed some ideas and initiatives uh, that we would like to look into this semester. From a list of about uh, 15 ideas, we narrowed it down and we chose five. The first initi initiative is to increase the visibility of the Student Senate. We are trying to diversify our communication channels. We started using Snapchat and we're also trying to um, have a more recruitment posters on campus. The PR committee would be in charge of this aspect. The second initiative is to see if the Interclub Council is meeting the needs of clubs and organizations on campus. Interclub and Activities Council purpose is to provide an open means of communication for student organizations and advisors to share information with each other and help each other with projects. The Interclub Council um, is also intended to provide leadership developments to club leaders. We started a survey in order to understand what clubs, and exp what clubs exp expectations are and how the Interclub Council can help them with their events and activities. The third initiative is to look into health insurance for JTCC students. Senators wanted to see if students can get um, health insurance through the college. As you may know, international students are required to have health insurance and the college administers that. We discussed the option of extending the opportunity to enroll all students. We realized that a few years ago, we, um, some information and brochures regarding healthcare were available on campus, in addition to a student health center. We wanted to know how many students are currently insured, if they are insured through their parents' insurance, and how much they are paying. The fourth student senate initiative is to look into uh, reorganizing the student senate to include the different academic departments on campus. The Student Senate has 30 seats and the college has about 30, um, sorry, the college has about 10 academic departments. The idea is to give each department the option of a seat in the Senate. Uh, one of the reasons uh, we think that this is worth discussion is to represent students for all the programs in the Senate. The fifth initiative is to increase the student engagement through the academic branch. Student Senate believes that learning uh, shouldn't occur in the classroom only, but also through involvement. By being part of club, by taking part in campus activities, and by attending campus events. I would like to thank professors who encourage their students to be involved. This initiative is primarily to encourage professors to motivate their students to be more involved. Because we believe that if students are involved today on campus, they will be involved tomorrow in their communities. As you can see, most of our initiatives rely on staff and faculty's help and contribution, and I would like to thank them for that. Uh, this concludes my student uh, Senate report. Thank you very much. I appreciate your leadership and the aggressive agenda you have. Any uh, comments or questions anybody has? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Good luck to you. College lobbyist report, Mr. Carter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> at the last month's report, I indicated that a lot, uh, not much was going on at the legislative level as far as committee work was concerned. We've certainly made up for uh, that this, the past few weeks, and I'd like to at least highlight a few of those bills that have been moving uh, through the process or at least are being talked about. Uh, but first, let me just kind of catch up a little bit on where the state is with its bank account. Uh, the end of January revenues were up $165 million, which pushes the checkbook for the state up to about $240 million. I think most of the folks that are watching the budget process are anticipating that we'll continue to see positive numbers uh, moving up through the uh, tax filing period uh, in April. However, I don't think we'll see a lot of movement on the really big issue, which is school finance, until after the April uh, consensus numbers come in. 
Um, interestingly, speaking of K-12 finance, the House and Senate both contracted with a consultant to uh, examine uh, K-12 finance, look at the studies that have been done over the, the past 20 years, and update those numbers uh, with respect to inflation. That consultant is going to give a midway report uh, on uh, the first week of March, kind of right after the turnaround period when uh, the legislators uh, come back after their brief break at the end of February. The, uh, um, there's a lot of unknowns about what that study may say. Uh, I think initially some folks thought that maybe with the adjustment for inflation that, that things would be, that would look fairly good after the uh, significant investment that was made by the legislature last year. Uh, I, think, I think that conversation could be turning a little bit and, and some folks are worried that the number could be larger than, than what the, uh, the large number that the governor uh, suggested in his state of the, Governor Brownback suggested in his first state of the state speech of around 600 million. Uh, the, uh, the other piece that, that plays into this mix, although there's no bill out there yet, but when we're talking about revenue to the state, uh, is a conversation that's begun bubbling up called the dark store theory. And that has to do with property tax uh, appraisal and valuations and the, and the way that those are handled, uh, depending on whether or not uh, a facility or a uh, commercial building is occupied or operating a business. There are several court, uh, court of tax appeals cases out there under, uh, currently under review. One in Wichita has already been completed. Uh, I think the, the folks who are pushing the issue are waiting at least until that process makes its way through the full, through the full process and, and there's some uh, answers or some outcomes related to those court of tax appeals cases. I can say that um, the numbers are big in Johnson County if the law were to change. Uh, and, the, and the numbers could be uh, a large impact even to institutions like the community college. Anyone who uh, gets a portion of property tax or has a mill levy is, um, that comes to their budget for operations will see an impact. I know that folks across the state aren't uh, as fully aware of what those numbers look like and I think that those conversations are being beginning to be held in, in outstate areas. I think the other piece that people are not taking into consideration are the 20 mills and the impact that that would have at the state level uh, and what that does in addition um, to the school finance uh, conversation that's being held. So I bring that up not because there's a bill or there's legislation pending, but because it's going to be a conversation that, that will be had in the not too distant future. I do know that the Senate tax chair, uh, though this is not in, in the calendar yet, is planning on having an informational briefing on this issue. Uh, but only one side of the, of the group is, is being allowed to present, and that, that is the folks that are, are currently challenging the current law. Um, so we'll see, we'll see what comes of that, that hearing or that brief information, uh, that inf informational briefing. Uh, the other interesting piece uh, in the way of revenue is uh, another um, informational briefing. We've had a lot of those this spring or this uh, winter. Uh, comes from the Department of Revenue and the Kansas Society of CPAs who have analyzed the federal tax code changes and what that means for the Kansas budget. And as we approach the next fiscal year, Kansas stands to uh, see an increase of around $138 million, uh, in its budget, and that number could go up, assuming that Kansas does not make any changes that align itself with the federal tax code. That could be helpful uh, given this overall conversation, uh, but again, there's a series of, of unknowns when it comes, uh, comes to that. Um, it's not news around here. We've got a new governor, and as of uh, Wednesday, um, we have a new lieutenant governor sworn in. Uh, both have been making their way around the state and will continue to do so for a period of time, whether you call them familiarization tours or, or just meet and greets. Uh, that is happening. Um, governor Collier gave his State of the State uh, speech last Wednesday. Uh, we're still waiting to see uh, any significant change uh, that from, from the current, um, from the, the previous administration. Uh, and Lieutenant Governor Mann comes to us from Salina, or at least most recently Salina. Uh, you may remember his name because he ran for Congress in 2010 in a six-way primary in the big first district. Uh, so that, that uh, experience should certainly help him uh, when it comes to running in a multi-candidate uh, primary for, for the governor's race. Um, you may see him uh, making his way around uh, the Johnson County area in the near future. I know that he's, uh, he's been uh, traveling the state uh, on a familiarization tour uh, since, since he was named, uh, just on Tuesday evening. 
Let's talk a little bit about the education budget uh, because that's where I think we're going to see the most impact this year. You'll recall that the governor's budget recommendations that I talked about last month um, put some money back into the CTE programs that hadn't been funded previously. It was a five-year plan. Uh, the, the House Appropriations Committee has um, generally moved forward with the governor's budget recommendations, but there's a little bit of a, a difference there, uh, and there's no impact or no negative impact to community colleges um, with, the, with the governor's budget recommendations. I think they tweaked a few things as it relates to state universities. Uh, but the Appropriations Chair uh, asked the Board of Regents for some options as it relates to restoration. You'll recall that the Board of Regents' uh, number one priority is restoring the 4% budget cuts that were made in uh, calendar year 2016, but budget year 2017. Um, clearly, with all that's going on, that's going to be a real challenge. Uh, I have attached a, um, I, I guess you could call it a spreadsheet, but it's a, a document that would go in a landscape uh, format in the report that uh, shows what some of those fractional percentages might look like for a restoration. And I think that when um, that committee um, starts talking about the supplemental bill in full, um, that they will be looking at what options exist. The Senate has not had that conversation yet, um, but that does um, prove to be promising that House leadership is supporting that, that move. That just came out late this afternoon, and so that's brand new, brand new information. The um, few bills that are out there, um, one uh, that came up on general orders had been sitting around uh, that had nothing to do with college campuses but did have to do with uh, reciprocity of concealed carry license uh, came up on general orders uh, a week and a half or so ago and that bill was amended uh, in several fashions uh, so just to give you a brief rundown of what occurred an amendment was added that would lower the age to 18 for those who uh, want to apply and uh, get a concealed carry permit uh, there was an attempt to amend the bill to permanently exempt college campuses from concealed carry, which failed on the floor, and then a follow-up amendment that uh, would change the concealed carry on campus to require um, a concealed carry permit. Uh, so again, it would meet that uh, the lowered age uh, range, uh, but if you wanted to conceal carry on campus, you would, uh, if the law were to pass, uh, the bill were to pass, you would be required to have a concealed carry permit. That bill passed out of the House and made its way to uh, the Senate. Uh, we're hearing that there will be no action taken in the Senate on that bill. Um, the other bill that I wanted to talk about also had a hearing this afternoon, uh, has to do with um, free speech on college campuses. The interesting component about that bill is no one knows where it came from and there were no proponents present to testify. <laughs> And so in a very um, unprecedented move, one of the senators sitting around the table just spoke in favor of the bill from, from his Senate chair. Um, there were a couple of written opponents that, uh, that provided testimony, and nobody's really certain uh, about what the bill's intent is or where it came from, though the reviser did indicate that, uh, that he has seen a trend of bills like those being discussed around the country. So we'll continue to, to monitor that. I don't believe there's any negative impact whatsoever. Um, to the operations that we would have on campus, and it's something that we've been talking about with the Government Affairs Task Force uh, on our weekly phone calls. The, uh, another interesting politically charged bill uh, that is having a hearing, well, I'm assuming that it's completed by now, but it uh, was moved up to today at 3.30 p.m., deals with a change in the way the, um, the Undocumented Immigrant Student Tuition uh, Act works. That bill was passed around 2004, 2006, and permits students that meet certain criteria, having attended a, the Kansas high school for three years, graduating, uh, to attend a community college or college uh, at an in-state rate. Uh, they receive no uh, scholarship or no assistance and, and pay that in-state rate. This bill that came out of nowhere um, last week uh, would charge those students the um, out-of-state rate and use the offset amount for the in-state rate to fund a Kansas foster care, uh, foster child educational act um, fund that was passed uh, a couple of years ago. It was an unfunded mandate that um, the higher education institutions simply absorb in their, in their operations. And there's a couple of sheets that I've attached to uh, my report that uh, are information that the Board of Regents provided to uh, the committee. They did not testify, nor did KACCT. Uh, but I thought that, that that information would be helpful for you as, as we continue to watch this bill move through the process. Uh, 
Finally, a couple of bills that, um, that were introduced um, related to the um, campus carry <laughs> issue. One is a bill, and I'm not sure why this bill hasn't been introduced uh, in, in the recent past, uh, maybe because uh, people didn't think that there was support there or the ability to, to move it. And I don't know if it's going to get a hearing because it's not been scheduled for one. Uh, but that's a bill that would repeal the prohibition uh, of lobbying for or against uh, gun control uh, if you receive state funds. Um, that bill uh, was introduced late last week, as was um, a bill that uh, simply mirrors the uh, amendment that Representative Barbara Ballard, in fact, she introduced the bill uh, from Lawrence uh, on the permanent campus uh, exemption, and that bill is 2685. We're reaching the end of the first, um, you can't call it a semester because that's not how it works in the legislature, but we're reaching the turnaround period where bills have to cross the, the House of Origin. House bill's got to go to the Senate, Senate bill's got to go to the House, unless they've been blessed by one of the, the rules that, uh, that exist out there that keeps bills preserved or keeps them alive. Um, there's not been a lot uh, to, to really exchange between the houses, and so it's going to be a very quick and brief turnaround period, uh, and then legislators will come back at the beginning of March and um, begin the, the process all over again um, for the second House of Origin. So, Mr. Chair, I would stop there and see if there's any questions, um, either about those bills or... I have two well, uh, the other trustees think about theirs. Um, regarding the uh, dark store theory, you mentioned it's considerable amount to Johnson County and JCC. Have you uh, done the analysis with staff to determine what that does impact uh, the county, how that does impact the county and the college? We have not talked um, specifically, although I've seen a document that has come from the Johnson County Appraiser's Office that indicates around a $10 million number, I believe, Dr. Sopcich? 10.5. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not Ten sure. Five, what? College. Mid college. Lost, lost revenue to the college. And that's just, just to JCCC. That's forever. I mean, that's permanent. Per, per year? Yeah, per year. Yeah. Your taxes get lowered. <clears throat> the thinking is that will then transfer to the property owner. So the property owner will pick up that 10.5, but I, I think that would be an interesting uh, and thing to watch. What's the theory behind the dark, dark store? Um, they, the, tax, the tax will be based on the dark store, box store. Uh, uh, of course, you know, I know Trustee Musil here is um, chomping at the bit to get on this, but it will be taxed as if the store is vacant. So it'll be dark, it'll be a vacant store. That, that theory can then spread to strip malls, it can spread to just about anything except the uh, personal residences of, of people. So, uh, I'll, I'll get some information from you. At I, it's, I think it's a national movement, isn't it? To, to lower it, taxes. It's a trend for, in the appraisal practice to value big box stores, particularly, differently than in the past, on the notion that once somebody, if Target leaves their store, that store is its value is way diminished because it was developed as a big box and as a target store and therefore it's not easily sold for the same value. And if tax values is fair market value, that lowers the value of the store as a target store, which has an effect on the taxes it pays and the taxes the city and the county and the state receive. I, I believe it's getting traction, they say it's getting traction in states like Wisconsin. Um, it's also popping up like in Texas. It's, it's, it'll be a national uh, initiative, I'm sure. And it's being promoted by business owners? Of well, I think Target, I, I believe it, Target did the first one. I don't know. That, yeah. that was the case in Sedgwick County. And that yes, case that's has made its, it's made through the process. But there are several cases here in Johnson County um, involving other large box type stores. I believe um, Bass Pro may even be one of those. Um, there's a number of them that are currently under um, that judicial review process uh, through the Court of Tax Appeals. Secondly, uh, last month you indicated that uh, the session was impacted by the K through 12 funding and that not much would happen until that was resolved. So when this study comes in the first part of March, uh, depending upon, of course, what that study indicates, um, how rapid do you anticipate the Senate or the House proceeding with whatever those results may be my assumption is that the reason for the study is to gather additional information, not to challenge the Supreme Court, but certainly to balance the Supreme Court's position that we're not funding schools properly. I think that um, the reason the study was, was um, commissioned was to get current data 
uh, with today's financial numbers. I do think that many legislators feel that their position was not adequately argued to the Supreme Court, and so I wouldn't dismiss that they wouldn't be taking that information back to the court um, to, to further supplement uh, what money they did infuse into K-12. Regarding the speed of which uh, that will occur, I think it will be difficult to say. My understanding is the final report is due somewhere around the middle of March. Um, so I don't really know what we're going to even see in this glimpse of, um, of the study that, that's coming out. I believe, that, I believe the folks are out of Texas that are doing the study. Um, I don't even know the name of the, the firm, but that's, that's just what we, we hear. And uh, I, I still don't think, even though they will get the information in March, I still don't think we'll see any significant movement until ap after April 15th. Keep in mind, the legislature goes on break uh, for three, three and a half weeks in, in April. And so I think, once again, when they come back at the end of April, that's when we'll see the, the yeoman's work take place. Thank you. Any comments, questions? I have one, though. Uh, yeah, could you please elaborate on how a bill can, can actually get in, get registered or whatever, and nobody knows who brought it? I mean, is it kind of like there's the papers are put in a bag and put in front of the revisor's office in the morning before anybody gets there? And they, I mean, how does that work? Somebody has to know who, yeah, who submitted just, that. It, there's a lot of number, uh, there's a number of ways a bill can become a bill. We could, we could get out the Schoolhouse Rock. Uh, cartoon if we wanted to some some meeting uh, there you know transparency has been a buzzword since Governor Collier's taken over and, and uh, even the house has has uh, initiated some steps to uh, um, look at how a bill is introduced and whose name is on it um, anyone can request a bill introduction uh, based on certain dates there's deadlines uh, so you can go to the microphone in a committee and request that a bill be introduced um, a committee can request that a bill be introduced, and so it will have the committee's name on the bill. Um, in the past, we've had to research the minutes pretty, pretty um, uh, thoroughly to find out if we really truly wanted to find out who requested the bill. Uh, that's why we go to committee, even though there's not anything on the agenda that, that maybe we're following, uh, just so we can see what that looks, what that process looks like. Um, I do think that we'll see some changes with that, but even even so. That doesn't change the process. Uh, it's all about the rules. The House has rules, the Senate has rules, and then there are joint rules. And when it comes to moving a piece of legislation through, we still have the gut and go process, and someone's name may be on a bill, and that bill becomes something else, and it has nothing to do with the person that introduced the bill. So it's, it's kind of one of those dicey answers that there's not a specific, specific route to trace back who, who introduced the bill. We're getting better at that. I say we're. I think, I think the, the legislative process is getting better at identifying that. Jerry? Yes, Greg. I, I just make a comment on the, on the bill that I, I suspect will go nowhere, but that would undo the legislature's work of a few years ago, which said you can't spend a dime of, quote, public money to lobby on anything for or against anything related to policy on guns. And I think it's, it's important for all of us here, they, that same muzzle could be imposed on anybody from a K-12 school district going up and talking about school funding, or anybody from a city going up and talking about potholes. And so I hope this legislature, in, in light of Governor Collier's and, and the legislative leadership's um, new embrace of transparency would understand that public officials, whether they're elected or they're professional staff, should have a right to go to Topeka and tell the legislators what they think on a particular policy issue uh, without being muzzled by the threat, I believe, of a misdemeanor crime. Um, so hopefully, uh, maybe that will get some traction. I doubt it this year, but maybe next year, um, that actual citizens can actually go up there and not worry about whether they put something on college letterhead and wondering if that would uh, risk a misdemeanor conviction. Yeah. Trustee Cross. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. A, a couple of questions for Mr. Carter and maybe even counsel. Um, I apologize as a, as a lawyer licensed in Kansas. I don't know exactly how the lieutenant governor is confirmed. Is this the, because under the Kansas Constitution, the governor has sole executive power, even then, as with the Attorney General and Secretary of State, the point the lieutenant governor is that how that works? That's within his purview of powers out, as outlined in the, so in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. process needed no. the federal level. And then 
And then second, uh, I think this was an issue last year, maybe in years past. Our, our executive was unable to testify one way or the other with respect to gun by campus. Is that right? There's already something in the, in the law. That, that's what Trustee Musil was uh, speaking yeah. about, is this bill would repeal that prohibition. <laughs> If the, the, the law the, the law that was added in, I think, 2013 says that if you receive any state appropriation, um, that organization cannot, you, you, can, you are not permitted to lobby for or against gun control. So it's both sides of the coin, but it's if you receive state appropriations. And, and because we know we hurt the feelings of some people when they watch this online or, or they're watching, uh, it sure seems to me like a free speech violation to be limiting uh, our ability, one way or the other, to speak out against it. So I would hope that that law changes. And uh, it, it'd be, I'm a litigator, so I don't mean to be biased, and I'm not looking for these piece of action. But it would sure be a shame to have litigation under this. And I would say, uh, just to respond, Trustee Cross, and to uh, uh, Teresa Sahar's uh, uh, testimony tonight, before that bill, uh, the chairman of our board at that time did testify uh, in Topeka against uh, guns on campus. So the college has officially taken a position against concealed carry. We have unanimously done Yes, we have. Well, and I, I presented positions last year as chair through a memo that didn't go on Johnson County Community College letterhead, but I did as the chair of this board based on our discussions that have been public. But it's ridiculous that if I had driven up there, I would have to make sure I'd, I couldn't get reimbursed by the college, and I better not put it on college letterhead, or somebody might go to jail for a misdemeanor crime. And that's, that's the silliness of it, um, that public elected officials or our staff cannot tell the legislature what our policy position is on, in, on, on an issue. I wholeheartedly concur, Mr. Chair. So neither our president nor General Richard Myers of Kansas State, who is a trained warrior, mm -hmm. can testify on this matter. It's just utter ridiculous. I do want to point out that last year, Dr. Harvey and Dr. Arjo uh, delivered a very eloquent testimony. Um, and even though it wasn't formally on behalf of the college, uh, they certainly were, I, I think they were speaking for those who of like mind. And, uh, uh, Trustee Lawson. Oh, uh, I just had a question about the legislation on DACA. If this starts to move, do we know the financial impact that that will have on the college? Uh, I. I I assume we can take a look at the numbers that are listed in the, num uh, the information that the Board of Regents provided to the committee and probably could get a sense on what that is. I don't know that we know. Um, the Regent number, I believe, is like 198, almost 200. We have 192, 192 of the 670 enrolled um, and across the state. I think from an enrollment projection, we anticipate decreased enrollment. Uh, by far, there are way more. There are 495 in community colleges, only 142 in universities. And that's because of the tuition differential. If we were to increase tuition to the out-of-state rate, I think it would make it prohibitive for a lot of students. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I would be surprised to see us increase revenue. I'd probably just see us decrease enrollment. Just for the public, can you give us a, a range of the in-state versus the out-of-state tuition? 94 for Johnson County residents for tuition and fees and 215 for out-of-state. It's quite a jump. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Carter, thanks. Uh, good luck. Um, I think uh, we have our work cut out for us as always, so thank you very much. Next item, our committee reports and recommendation. The first is the audit report. I'll report that the audit committee did meet on uh, Thursday, February 8th, uh, here in this building at 8 o'clock. Uh, we have one item to bring to you, uh, one recommendation for action, and that is the um, RFP for external audit services. I would remind uh, new trustees that we have an internal audit team that meets regularly, and this is for our external audit uh, uh, needs. You'll see that we uh, eight firms were notified, six firms responded. Uh, the review committee, uh, again, went through an extensive uh, analysis of the, of, of the uh, finalists. Uh, you can see that the low bid uh, is being recommended for our approval. And so it is the recommendation of the Audit Committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve the establishment of a contract for annual financial audits, audit services for the College's fiscal year ending June 30, 2018 with Reuben Brown LLP and the amount of $76,350. I'll second. 
<clears throat> and I'll make second. that motion. Thank you. Second. Any uh, discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We also had a uh, quarterly projects update. Uh, Ms. Vogler and Ms. Boyd presented information on our in-process and planned audits. Uh, the inclu uh, they, these include an audit of procurement contracting services, which is currently underway, and an upcoming cloud uh, computing audit, which is to be outsourced. Uh, and that can only be done on cloudy days, so we have to be uh, <laughs> sensitive to the weather. That's what I know about the clouds. Um, we, uh, we had quite a discussion on the audit matrix. We have a number of items that we audit uh, each uh, period. And uh, it's really quite interesting. Those, uh, those audits are listed from uh, slight to severe uh, in terms of how we approach them. There are people assigned to them with a timeline, and, and it's really quite, uh, quite detailed of how our internal audit committee works on those areas. Uh, the ethics report line was updated. Um, uh, we had, um, through January 31st, from October 24th, last quarter, to January 31st, seven reports were received via the ethics line. Three reports were received anonymously. And as of January 30th, five have been reviewed and appro appropriately addressed, and two are in current progress. So again, I, I really feel um, confident that that process works well and we, we deal with those issues in a timely manner. Uh, we also had a, an update on the COPS watch uh, case data. And um, uh, I guess you know, we had an executive session just dealing with uh, post-audit results, uh, all very, very well done. I will defer to Trustee Ingram, who sits on that board as well. But again, I just... Uh, I really feel confident that with our team led by uh, Janelle Vogler that, uh, and, and our external auditors that the college is in really, really great operating condition. So, uh, Trustee Ingram, any comments? I, I would agree that was the first uh, meeting that I had attended as a member of that committee. So it was all fairly new, but feel very confident with uh, our leadership. So thank Any questions you. about the audit? Our next audit quarterly meeting will be in May. Uh, and again, held at 8 a.m. Our next item is collegial steering. Uh, collegial steering did meet on February 6th, and uh, we have representation from the uh, Faculty Association, the Faculty Senate Educational Affairs Administration. We had two agenda items. Uh, we reviewed the purpose of the committee, just to make sure that the new players, we changed uh, trustees on that committee in January with the election, uh, that we all understood why we were there. And then um, we, we went into quite a robust discussion on academic freedom, uh, which uh, Trustees uh, Musil and I guess Sharp. Sharp was on that committee. That happened to be on agendas uh, in the first uh, semester of the year. Probably has been on the agenda for several uh, semesters of every year. Uh, <clears throat> but we really had a terrific discussion, I thought. And uh, Dr. McLeod has uh, uh, put together a one-page uh, uh, statement on academic freedom, which is really uh, uh, foundationally built from the AAUP, the American Association of University Professors. Uh, there's a distinction there between uh, academic freedom and freedom of speech. And uh, I, in fact, uh, being uh, as anal as I am about meetings, had to cut off the discussion, got chastised by the president to say this is the best discussion we've, we've had on academic freedom, and, uh, but... Uh, <laughs> Nothing to do with the leadership of the chair. <laughs> yeah, <there you laughs> we, uh, we, we cut last. it off, uh, but uh, I, that will continue to be uh, pursued and discussed, I think, by uh, the team, uh, the Association, the Senate, at Affairs and the Administration. But thank you, Dr. McLeod, for uh, give, getting us to that point. Uh, it's, uh, it was really kind of interesting. So with that, uh, our next meeting is uh, March... Sixth, and so we look forward to uh, our next time with collegial steering. Next item is uh, human resources. Uh, Trustee Cross. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. The uh, Human Resources Committee met at 9:30 a.m. on Monday, February 5th, in uh, the Robert Milo Conference Room. And uh, Trustee Lawson was present. Uh, uh, Becky uh, Sentlever and Chris Gray and others were there, including the, uh, FA President Dennis Arjo and Dr. Joe Sancho. Uh, the medical plan presentation review uh, was made by Mr. Jerry Zimmerman, uh, 
who introduced Matt Wheeler and Michelle Oldy of Holmes Mercy, Holmes Murphy, who presented a high-level renewal summary of the JCCC medical and dental vision plans. Uh, Ms. Sintlever uh, gave an overview of the upcoming negotiations. The mandatory contract negotiation training was completed last week. The contract negotiations have been set for February 20th, 22nd, 23rd. March 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 2018. Ms. Sentlever also gave an update on the faculty salary study being conducted by an outside compensation consultant, and we hope to have that final report in the next few weeks. Uh, Ms. Colleen Chandler, uh, Human Resources reviewed the results of ex exit interviews for the fourth quarter of 2017. HR began conducting stay interviews in January 2017, which includes interviewing employees at approximately the six-month service date defaults for full and part-time employees for the second quarter calendar hires of 2017 were reviewed. And Ms. Chandler also reviewed recommended changes to the policies in hiring and onboarding section in the college's policy library. The HR committee has reviewed the recommendation to the changes to the policies in the hiring and onboarding section of the college's policy library, which have been reviewed as part of the uh, broader assessment college's personnel policies and procedures. The recommended updates, including material changes noted in the table below, serve uh, on the board packet on pages four and five, excuse me, serve to condense several small policy statements and bring current the policy language based on present job titles, terminologies, and practices. And you can see that in the packet of pages four and five. Uh, we do have a recommendation tonight. Uh, it is the recommendation of the HR committee that the board of trustees accept the recommendation of the college administration to approve the modification to the following policies, certific certification and licensing, criminal background check, new hire paperwork, posting for vacancy, and also approve deletion of the following policies, application for employment, appointment to position, employment interviews, medical examination, oath of employment, polygraph test, recruitment, screening of applications, and work authorization, as is shown in the board packet. And before I make the motion, I'd like to ask Ms. Sintlever uh, to talk about, <clears throat> I think, uh, Trustee Lawson has some questions on the criminal background check mm -hmm. and the, the exact language that we're using. Um, I know I've had discussions with Ms. Wilson about it. I feel comfortable that we're going to be making this review on a case-by-case -case basis, as is the recommendation of Ms. Wilson and staff. Could you talk a little bit about that, or I can let Trustee Lawson ask her own question? Let's, uh, before we do that, let's get a motion and a second so we get it on the table. Uh, and then I we'll have done what... Well, then we can do that after. I just think protocol wouldn't be proper to make the motion and get it on the table. Yeah. So if we make the motion in a second, then we'll go through what's your request. But to get it on the table to discuss, we should have a motion in a second. Are you making that motion? I'm not making the motion. I also move just to have the discussion. Trustee Musil moves. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Sittler, yes. could you please address what I think you understand the concerns? <laughs> yes. Um, the background checks, basically, on this particular background check, we have a third party vendor that does those for us. And so once um, the background checks come back, um, all of them either come back as a pass or if something does flag that comes out of our adjudication guidelines, it comes back as pending. And then we take a look at each of those and we look at the, basically, the, um, the events that got flagged, uh, we look at how that applies to the jobs that they're applying for. We look at the timeline as far as when it happened, um, how egregious it was, and like that. And so we look at those on a case by case basis um, and then make a determination and then all of those. Trustee Lawson. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I have some thoughts on this, and I appreciate Trustee Cross um, allowing this opportunity to speak on that. Uh, I really want to make sure that the Kansans that exit the prison system, that are low-risk, nonviolent um, people that have felonies on the records, that their debt is paid to society. But I think sometimes, inadvertently, our society can continue to punish them in different ways. Um, one of those ways is the ability to find a job. Um, the return rate to prison in Kansas right now is 36%, and a job can make all the difference in someone's life. Um, they become taxpayers, families are reunited, and out of the foster care system, they are also making a living, so they are not needing the requirement of government aid. 
um, in D.C., Senator Roberts took notice when I brought up the importance of including ex-offenders in the Pell Grants uh, awarding. He also mentioned that our president has an interest in the integration of ex-offenders back into our community. So I really want to make sure this policy is sensitive to this issue. Uh, I know that the policy sounds like it's case by case, but I feel it's important to have that specific wording because I believe it helps to clarify the policy. I'd also feel like having a statement that states a reason for why an applicant was not hired when the applicant also carries a felony is important. So that applicant has that journey, they know that process, they're given that information to absolutely. contact. Absolutely, absolutely. And they have access to the system so they can actually see the same record that we receive. Okay, and the, and the specific wording of case by case? Um, we don't have that, but if you notice the last paragraph of that policy does talk about that it doesn't necessarily disqualify an applicant or employee from employment and the nature and seriousness of the offense the date of the offense and surrounding circumstances, rehabilitation problems of the offense, um, those are all taken into consideration okay. when we look at those. Thank you. I'm okay. Were these issues vetted in committee? No, um, because Trustee Cross was not there, I did not feel there was a quorum, so I recommended not to bring these forward to the board. So they're here now, so I think there was just a little bit of a miscommunication. So are we all comfortable with what we're voting on? I'd rather refer it back to the committee, Mr. Chair. Frankly, that was one of the reasons why I refrained from making the motion. My son had a tube fall out of his left ear and we had to have the surgery well, to put it back in. That was the reason why I wasn't present. I wanted additional information before I made the motion. So I, I would feel more comfortable referring it back to the committee. What would be proper protocol in terms? I guess we could defeat the motion, mm -hmm. and then if the committee wants to take it back for further vetting, uh, just withdraw. Yeah, that was my question. Most of this is just the cleanup language and just getting it consistent with our. A thirty-day delay wouldn't make a difference. You could. I withdraw my motion. Yeah. Same, you can roll that okay. policy from the motion okay. and then take the rest of the policies. Motion has been withdrawn, the second's been withdrawn, and the chair has requested to go back to committee. Uh, and uh, staff is saying that's not a problem, so we'll take it back to committee. Trustee Cross, next item. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you. Okay. Learning quality. Trustee Lawson. Uh, I appreciate the new minute format. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. McLeod. Uh, I felt that that helped to show the public um, some of the process that we go through in that committee. Uh, and also adding the annual working agenda to the board packet. I think that's helpful when seeing the LQ and, and four and stuff. I think the public can be very um, more tuned into that. Um, per the discussions in our committee, the trustees have not had a chance to meet with the president to go over the specific time that we were discussing. Uh, and I I believe we'll get together before the next March committee and have that discussion to explore any possibilities if or not. Um, this month we had our learning quality committee meeting. We began discussing about how to improve our practice. I'd like to thank Trustee Musil and Snyder for working with me on developing what I hope is a fairly assertive agenda about looking into the future of our education at the college. Uh, everything else is in the board packet. Any questions of Trustee Lawson? Very good. Management, Trustee Lindstrom. You have a oh, I'm sorry. You had a recommendation? Page 18. Yeah, you did. Thank you. Amendments to transfer credit. It is the recommendation of the Learning Quality Committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve the proposed amendments to the transfer credit policy as shown um, in the Board packet. Is there a second? Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Trustee Lawson. Management, Trustee Lindstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the management committee met at 8 a.m. on Wednesday, February 7, 2018, right here in the boardroom. The information related to this meeting uh, begins on page 23 and runs through 27 of the board packet. Uh, trustees Musel, Schneider, and I <laughs> we 
received uh, several presentations from staff. We had an update from Emily Behrman, uh, General Manager of Performing Arts on the College's Performing Arts Programming and a financial report with an overview of expenses and income and highlights of the renovation completed in the Carlson Center. And special thanks went to donor support. Uh, Emily also spoke very highly of the volunteers or the ball, ball stars that work and perform in, during performances and activities related to the arts education resources. Sherry Barrett, the uh, Director of Assessment, Evaluation, and Institutional in Outcomes, presented information on the upcoming accreditation site visit. Johnson County Community College will have an evaluation visit, <coughs> excuse me, by peer reviewers of the Higher Learning Commission, HLC. That visit is scheduled for the spring, and Dr. Barrett explained the role of the Board of the Trustees in this process in what we can do to prepare for a successful visit. I have information here if anyone has questions on that. It's also in the board packet. Rachel Lears, uh, Associate Vice President of Financial Services and Chief Financial Officer, gave the, the monthly budget update. Uh, Mitch Borsch's uh, Associate Vice President of Business Services presented the sole source report. He also gave a bid summary, which can be found on page 23 of the board packet. Uh, Rex Hayes, Associate Vice President of Campus Services and Facility Planning, gave a monthly update on the capital infrastructure projects, and his report is on page 24 of the packet. Rex also reviewed the re uh, in the report uh, on financial status of the facilities master plan projects, and it is in your packet on page 25. Although there are no items to bring forth to the uh, board this evening, uh, yesterday, staff updated trustees on the current status of the facility <coughs> master plan uh, phase two, and as a result of that work a session, and based on the information presented to us, I would suggest that the board take this opportunity to encourage and direct staff to proceed with their work towards a uh, uh, guaranteed maximum price uh, and deliver a uh, facilities master plan phase two. Uh, report to the Board of Trustees for our review and our response. I think, I think that, th thank you, Trustee Lindstrom. <clears throat> uh, when we left that uh, retreat, uh, I just wanted to make sure that we all understood that uh, we didn't want to hold up the process for GMP, but <coughs> nothing begins on any of those projects until we've had a chance to evaluate the GMPs. I think, Trustee Musil, you uh, had some interest to make sure that we don't slow the process up. I, I'm very comfortable after yesterday proceeding to get the guaranteed maximum price on the phase, the four phases of phase two, the four different projects within phase two, and the line items, the major line items within each one. Um, I still have a question, and I'll work with staff about getting the timing of those because they're going to come in at different times. Yes. It makes it hard to prioritize between and among them if so, if we would choose to do so as a board or as individual trustees, but I'm very comfortable proceeding forward with the programming and the design work. We have to do it, and then it's it's shovel ready when we're ready to go fund it. Okay, Trustee Lawson. Now, the one thing I was thinking about is the science labs, is finding some way to integrate them into the master plan, not doing the work right now, but just knowing that that will be coming down the road. We have a plan for budget. Were some thoughts as I was driving home so that it's not in hopes of that board's decision that they include the science labs, but it is part of this one big master plan. Just some thoughts. So uh, we're really not asking for any more detail on GMPs on that, but we just want to make sure that we're aware that those projects are coming. Exactly. And I think Trustee Musil, uh, this comment was, uh, are, there, are there other areas that we should be thinking about down the road and not just what's uh, currently being discussed. Sure. And, and that would be in the, the form of, let's say, a five to ten year master plan, something along those lines. Sure. So um, it would also um, help to inform trustees who will follow some of you exactly what the institution's been looking at over an extended period of time. That's what I Very good. Uh, so for, for the benefit of the new trustees, um, Rex has the, the facilities book, right. and that is also an electronic form yes. that may be beneficial for uh, the new trustees and 
uh, the, the mold trustees as well. Right. For um, now, you said this, but don't you mean this? It's, yes. yes it's, for it's trustees a, Lawson and Snyder, that's a kind of a listing of every single thing on campus that. Um, is going to wear out or the expected renewal. Um, everything is listed there, so it gives us some idea. And those are primarily operational, um, operational functions. Right. Yeah. And I would suggest that uh, on your report, Trustee Lindstrom, when you talked about the facilities master plan projects, uh, a lot of those emanate out of that report as we've discussed it over time. So. The, the purpose of my uh, comment there is there is no uh, I ish items that uh, management is uh, very unusual. There is no items bringing forth to the board to, tonight. So I, but I, in reflecting on last night's meeting, I thought it would be appropriate at least to have the board weigh in to staff and, and give some kind Thank of Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Any other questions of the uh, long management meeting you had uh, this past month? <laughs> Thank you. President's report, recommendation for action. Treasurer's report is the first one, Trustee Cross. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just had pulled up my agenda. Treasurer's report is a report about lots of detail about financial information that was processed during the last uh, period, and it is so cumbersome that we're uh, allowing Trustee Cross additional time to pull that up. Isaac is saying that uh, page 28 of the board packet. Yeah. I apologize. I have a new laptop. As you know, yesterday I had difficulties, and it's user error. Uh, the Treasurer's report, the following uh, pages contain the Treasurer's report for the month ended December 31st, 2017, state operating grant payments of $10.3 million, and the ad valorem property tax distribution of $53.4 million were received during January and will be reflected in next month's report. Expenditures in the primary operating funds are within the approved budgetary limits, and it is therefore, Mr. Chair, the recommendation of the college administration that the Board of Trustees approve the Treasurer's report for the month of December 2017, subject to parties. A motion. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. All in favor signify by saying aye. Yes. Aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Trustee Cross, anything else? Yes, I thank uh, Rachel Lears and the staff whom I trust uh, greatly uh, for their work on this effort. And that concludes my report, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Dr. Sopcic. This past week, uh, Trustees Lawson, uh, Trustee Cook, and myself attended the National Legislative Summit for Community Colleges. About 900 to 1,000 um, trustees and uh, community college presidents were in attendance. It was, uh, it was a fascinating experience. We also got to visit our own legislators, Senators Moran and Roberts, as well as Congressman Yoder. But a big issue um, facing all community, uh, community colleges certainly came, that came out there was the Higher Education uh, Act. Um, that will potentially affect all of us, and a big part of that was financial aid. And Pell grants, SCOG grants, all these different types of things. And, 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 financial, and financial aid is kind of like a quagmire. It's so complicated, it can be so convoluted. And so I, I asked Randy Weber um, last night, basically, if he could give us a little overview of our financial aid picture, and also tie that into a little overview on the enrollment report that you all, you just saw today, um, that, that came out. And so Randy, could you please take us through that? Here, uh, trustees have, have these slides in a packet to help a little bit to guide through them. Um, we don't ha really have the lightning round tonight, um, but I'm going to try to do basically uh, a, a brief enrollment profile, how we look at our students, what the trend's been a little bit with them, uh, as well as kind of the student aid that, that will follow up that story that makes a little more sense. In hopes that if you guys have some follow-up questions, then we can definitely um, go into a deeper dive with some of those things. And um, as Dr. Sopchik mentioned, uh, with short notice with somebody who has very limited um, chart-making skills, we, we went down to chart, one, uh, I wouldn't even say 101 today, we're probably in developmental chart-making with my <laughs> skills. But what, what I've got in front of you here a little bit is this is our total fall head count. And this is per our census report. And so some, we've talked a lot in the past about we're doing a lot of a lot of work on census is essentially 20th day for us this year. It was just this last Tuesday in spring. Um, that's the state headcount report we give. 
but we also do a lot of enrollments toward end of term. So this is part of our story, but it's definitely not our whole story. And where a lot of our enrollment, enrollment growth as an institution has come of late has been late, late start, late session courses. Um, all that said though, on our census date, in the fall of 2013, you can see, um, not very well from the back, uh, that we had a, a fall enrollment of 19,672 uh, students. This fall, and, I, and, I, and I'll say this briefly, this fall we had 18,638. Last fall we were at 19,139. If you recall this fall, we had the decision that was made with high school students that, that impacted the students who potentially would have been enrolled at census date and then there were, were enrolled shortly thereafter, that would have seen an increase of a couple hundred students. So we probably would have been looking at probably closer to about 18.9. It's not a hard number I can give there. But saying that it's around that number, over the last four years, um, five falls, we've experienced an overall enrollment decrease of around four and a half percent. Um, that's very typical given the economy that's better than the national average has been performing. We are in one of the lowest uh, unemployment rates in the country and so typically when people are employed they're not looking for education and vice versa when they can't find a job they go back for skills training and so we, we, this, is, this is a very typical trend for us. What I want to do now is just give a little bit of a deeper dive as far as when we look at that number, what does that mean? And so this line here at the top, and I, the lines probably tell more story than, than the numbers in this case. This line at the top, and this is our fall census date age count. And so when you look at from fall 13 to fall 2017, this is our traditional age student from 18 to 23 years old. And despite a 4.5% decrease in enrollment, we're up over 180 students in this range. So the I'm going to college population has not decreased for us uh, straight out of high school, even despite our, our aggressive uh, dual credit and, and concurrent enrollment trends. Um, the next line here is our under 18 group, and you can see that that one has gone from about 3477 to probably closer to what would have been about um, 4,000 again. It probably would have been flat this year uh, if, if we followed the exact same enrollment trend. That's an increase of 600 students. And so we, we look at that when we look at the 18 to 23 range, how many of our students took classes in high school and now may not be looking to directly matriculate to us. And when we look at some of those numbers from a recruitment standpoint, we're really excited about how we hold up and, and, and tell our story and, and continue to enroll students. The next four populations are really where we've seen the decrease in enrollment and where a lot of our conversations about what are we doing, how are we supporting um, our students come from. So the gray line here is our 24 to 29 range. And when you look at that, in 2013, we had 3,100 students enrolled in this age group. We now have 2,600, so we're down over 500 students in this age range alone. The next age range, age range is the 30 year olds, 30 to 39, down another 500 students, 40 to 49, 300 students, 50 plus, 300 students. So it's that 24 plus, that not what we typically phrase as a non-traditional student, though we don't know what a traditional age student is anymore because our average age is 26 and a half, but it's that non-traditional college age student is what's down by a combined 11, 16, over 2,200 students. And when you look at the traditional age student, high school and, and 18 to 23, we're up over 700 students in this time. And that's why sometimes it's important to break it down and look at these numbers in this way because it tells a different story within. We are out in our high schools. We do still have good reputation uh, within our local community where students who want to come to college will. But I think people looking for a better life through going to education versus work that's where we're experiencing some of our challenges. Um, the next thing I want to talk a little bit on the next chart will then be by student population. And this has, has some merit and some value because then we look at how are our recruitment efforts going, how are our retention efforts going. And so this top line here represents our continuing students. So these would be the students who were enrolled in a previ the previous term. So if it's spring, they were enrolled in fall, uh, et cetera. So we had... Uh, in fall of 13, we had 10,700 students who would have been enrolled in spring of 13. Whereas this fall, 
we had 9,500 students. So even students who are participating, our retention was struggling. Uh, we recognize, you can see on this line here, these first three years, we recognize this decline. And that's one of the things we've worked really hard on in, in our Pathways project in particular. Our first time in college students, we've seen a better increase. But even fall to fall overall at the college, when we were down 2% this year, our continuing students was actually up 30, 51 students. That's a win, and so we're excited about that. Um, but uh, we, do, we, we watch these in this way. The next line is our high school students. Once again, it has kind of that anomaly there. Assuming flat this year, we would, we would have gone up by about 600 students. That's, that's pretty equivalent to the under 18, so that, that parallels that under 18 pretty well. Um, the first time in college, and so this talks a little bit about that, this, this that light blue line, and it's held flat for the last four years, from 2547 to 2598. So people who are coming to college for the first time are still coming to Johnson County Community College at the same rate. Uh, the next line is a guy who fat fingers his numbers, and we did not experience a significant transfer drop last year. I think I forgot a four, so it should be one four four seven. So transfer, and, and, and interestingly enough, in the fall of 13, transfer plus um, uh, previously attended were combined. So we, we've modified the report since then, um, but it is it is worth noting that the, the transfer and returning to us together are down 300 students. So we're down 300 students for people who are either coming back to school or have decided I'm gonna to go to Johnson County from somewhere else. That has a result to do again with other schools, maybe retention efforts, as well as uh, just employers' ability to retain their employees. And then lastly, this low green line here um, is other, and the way we define other, most of those are railroad. Um, yeah, so we, we lump them in there, and that's, that happens to be down just a little bit here. Um, the next thing I want to point out is just some demographic characteristics of our students. Our ethnicity, not surprisingly, we are, um, much like our local community, significant Caucasian white. Um, in the last number of years, our Hispanic population has overtaken our African American population. Uh, our Hispanic population, up until this year, was our only growing uh, ethnic population at the college. We put a lot of efforts into and there. It's been a growing community. But even this past fall, we experienced a, <coughs> a dip in our Hispanic uh, enrolled students. Next couple slides I have then, and I want to talk just briefly, uh, and we're wrapping up here, is uh, our head count by their enrollment status, but then how they enroll in credit hours. So when you look at our the, the chart on the left, what this says here is of all our students enrolled in fall 13, 6,300 of them were full time, whereas 13, or excuse me, yeah, 13,000 of them were part time. So two to one ratio basically of part time to full time. And so that counts when we do parking and admissions applications and how we do registration processes. When you look at hours at the college, though, you start to see it a lot different. And I mean, the, the math would explain that. But full-time students then take just over half of the college's credit hours. And so when we lose a part-time student versus when we lose a full-time student, it talks about the impact of of that a little bit. And so just to, to, to kind of remind us that yes, we have less full-time students, however, they are taking more of the hours. Um, and then the last one I have here to do part of the enrollment. It's full-time 12 credit hours. 12 in credit hours in the, in the fall and spring, yes. Thank you for asking that, I'm sorry. Um, and then the last one here, before we just briefly talk about the financial aid, is um, the, the head count and, and, and credit hours by degree seeking, non-degree seeking. So you've heard us talk a little bit in the past about our pathways and retention strategies and what we're trying to do to help our degree seeking students um, reach their educational goals. And so when you look at the 22% of high school students, they may or may not attend Johnson County and they would come as first time in college if they come after high school. So then I, sometimes what I do is I say of the others. But when I look at the others, I look at degree seeking versus non-degree seeking and from that standpoint, we're sitting at over a four to one ratio of degree seeking versus non-degree seeking. And it's even more extreme um, when, when we look at the credit hours that they take at the college. And you've got an over five to one ratio here. And so when we think about the impact of 
our degree or certificate seeking students and their educational goals, we start to see that almost three quarters of the credit hours that we're, that we're delivering to students are students who have an educational goal to achieve a degree or a certificate. And, and so that's why a lot of our energies, uh, not every energy, but a lot of our energies are targeted to those populations. Um, and the last thing I've got here in, 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 in I'm sorry, you Hold on. Are there any questions on any of these charts before we get to financial aid? I do, I do have uh, a question. Um, on the first couple of graphs, do you, would you have information regarding peer institutions nationally on that? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We can go in, and, and I, I, I know that nationally, the last four or five years, the average for community colleges has been at about 2% or more drop. So you take that over four years, you're looking at probably 8 to 10% drop. But I would, I would want to verify that. But okay. uh, And then the other, the other question I had, um, you made me think about it in, in your presentation, is um, is there a possibility that we, or maybe uh, I'm just throwing this out to see if it's something we need to think about, a ratio uh, for the fluctuation in enrollment versus the growth in population of Johnson County too. Yeah, so so probably we the 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 best analysis we have of that that we do is we do a, a, a yield rate or a penetration rate for our high schools, and so we look at what their graduating classes are size wise. We know the the fifth grades are larger than sophomore classes now, so we look at the percentages we yield from them. Interestingly, and not so right but not surprisingly enough, um, is that the schools where we have more of our concurrent courses taken are the schools where we get less of the graduating high school population percentage base. And we have such varying high school graduating at our high, what we like to do is their rates versus their numbers when we, when we look at those. And so we, we have as low as, for the public uh, Johnson County schools, I think we have as low of a 12, 13% per, uh, penetration rate or yield rate of graduating high schools and as high as about 27% of uh, one or two high schools in, in our county who directly attend Johnson County afterwards. But as far as the, the overall county, you know, it would be an interesting thing to look at. I do know that when you look at the census report, what it'll tell you is Johnson County population is growing, but a lot of it is educated people moving to Johnson County, so they're probably not seeking an education. So that's one of the reasons we look at the K-12 is it's more likely to see their kids coming to school versus people moving here looking for an education. Thank you, Christine. <coughs> All righty. And then so... With this, there's a, there's a lot of numbers in this chart here, but, but what I wanted to get at a little bit, this top line here is the total <coughs> amount of FAFSAs we receive, which is free application for federal student aid. Every student has a right to fill out a FAFSA. It's free. Um, the completed apps are how many that we get that they actually do everything they need to do. We see that we, we, we had high numbers of 3856, and they've been decreasing with a small uptick again this year. That's important to know because I think what we're seeing there as we're decreasing in, in student population, but even at a greater rate, we're, we're, we're decreasing in students who receive aid as, as, a, as a population. Um, and and that, that number would be, could be reflected by what I'm gonna put at the bottom here, and I got my arrow on. We, we, we awarded some form of fund to 6,800 students in the 14-15 year compared to 5,600 last year and a lot of that will be Pell and Loan. But just to talk through this just briefly, um, JCCC scholarships, these, these, two, these two tables here represent um, how much we offered in aid to students and then the one below it is how much we actually pay, paid in aid. Sometimes we paid more than we offered because it was initial offerings um, and, and, and we, we ended up with more scholarship or, or follow through there. But the, the, the things to, that, I, that I like seeing here, um, we offer between the foundation and our student fees, we offer in over $2.4 million in, in aid or scholarships to students. And those scholarships obviously don't have to be returned. We have generous donations uh, through, through local foundation uh, as well as some student, student grants that, that go through there. We pay about $2.3 million and, and institutional scholarships. Um, the next couple lines here are, are we've talked a little bit about this with the group. 
um, the Pell Grants. And, and, and to provide a little bit of context, a student's eligibility for Pell Grant and loan, and to some degree SEOG, which our, our scholarship team uh, provide, push, or excuse me, our financial aid team uh, award, somewhat case by case. It, the SEOG administration is a little bit trickier. But the Pell Grant and the loan eligibility is determined by a student's what we call EFC, which is an estimated family contribution. So the amount we award is not impacted by um, the government giving us money. It's truly a student's score and their decision to enroll here and the amount of hours they take. So if they take six hours or half time, nine hours or three quarter time, 12 hours, they're full time. And so their eligibility for federal aid would be there. We wouldn't run out of federal money to award is probably the easiest way to say that. It's just dependent upon our enrolled students and their eligibility. And so in this case here, we either have fewer students who are looking for aid. The other thing we saw with the economic uptick is less students eligible for aid. Families who are recovering economically and have higher uh, home, home income would impact the student's eligibility. But you can see we've given from 14.6 in Pell and we're down, I, this, this year still, we're, is a still work in progress because we're in the spring semester. So I'll just use a two year roll here from about 14.7 to 11.3. So we've, we've decreased our Pell, Pell offer and awards pretty significantly. Um, the SEOG stands for Student Education Opportunity Grant, and that's grant money that our staff uses often to backfill with students who, who need some additional funds to complete their courses. Maybe they run out of Pell in fall and spring, and we might give some summer aid so they can continue in summer. Uh, there's some, some discretionary award there. Um, the thing that we get most excited about is some strategies that we've deployed. When you look here and see that we gave over $14.3 million in loans two years ago, and now we're giving just north of 10 million. So we're down over $4 million in loan award. And so, Randy, uh -huh. all these numbers are down, not just the federal dollars, is that right? Um, no, all the, um, help me under. All of our uh, scholarships, Pell Grants, uh, loan subsidies across the board are down, not just the federal. Correct, yeah, our, our, our JCCC scholarships are close to flat. So what we give in institutional aid are, are flat. What we're allowed to award in SEOG is what we kind of watch. SEOG and work study is a permission for us to be able to award. Um, Pell Grant and loans are student eligibility based on federal scores. And so we're down, but we're down in eligible students or the amount the student is eligible for. That's kind of a blend there, but we watch our cohort default rate. One of the things we know is that students, community college students have higher default rates, but they have lower loan amounts. So a community college student may be defaulted on $1,200, um, and there may be 10 of them, so that's what, $12,000. But one university student might be defaulted on $30,000. And so a lot of the default risk is against university students, but the numbers are against community colleges just because of the loan numbers. But our teams worked really hard to make sure that we're not over awarding loans so students don't get caught up in student loan debt. That's kind of a nutshell on, and, and, and provided you some take home information there with slides on what we award, uh, and I'd definitely be willing to answer any questions. Randy, I, I'm trying to find your email that you sent me, um, but I'll just go from memory, <clears throat> which is dangerous. Um, one of the items at ACCT, as we did our lobbying, and one of the um, federal policy positions of both AACC and ACCT is, uh, and, and Dr. Sopcich referenced the Reauthorization Act as the PROSPER Act. And within the PROSPER Act, which is a component of the Reauthorization Act, uh, is the new uh, idea that colleges should pay back uh, uh, finan uh, appell financial assistance for students that dropped out of, of class early. And the, the change has been that it used to be that if you completed 60% of the year, there wouldn't be a penalty. But now some of our uh, congressmen are getting creative in saying that uh, they've broken it into four quarters. So if you drop out in the first 25% of the semester, the college has to pay back 100% of that Pell money. If the student drops out at 50% of the semester, 50% of the money, I'm sorry, 75% of the money, and if they drop out at 75% of the semester, they have to pay back 50%. 
Uh, and then if, if, even if they go to 99% of the semester and drop out, don't complete the semester, the college has to pay back 25% of that penalty. It's a, it's a huge number uh, nationwide, uh, millions of dollars. And I think uh, it's called the uh, RTT4, return R2T4, to... R2T4, yeah. Yeah, R2T4, return to... Uh, it's return to Title IV. Title IV, Title IV money. Title IV money, yeah. Fund, you bet. So, uh, and, and it seemed to me that that was like uh, 150 some thousand a semester, $300,000 for a year, and the college would have to pay that back. And the thinking is that it incentivizes the college to help students complete the program. And yet, students drop out for a number of reasons that are not under the control of the college. So that's something we're watching and looking at, but if you hear of discussion on the PROSPER Act, that's, that's one of the items. Paul. For a student that's taking 12 or 15 hours, a full-time student, what, what would be the expected cost of books? <clears throat> yeah, I wish I could answer that. The cost of books really depends on the program a student study and I mean there there are programs that, that have next to nothing. If, if you're pre-med, you're going to be pretty expensive books um, because a lot of the science books uh, in particular, but there are a lot of other courses. STEM that, fields you're probably going to average somewhere in the in the wheelhouse of um, six to seven hundred dollars. Um, starting out, uh, whereas humanities fields, you will probably be averaging somewhere more in the $400 range. So, and can students typically borrow more than the cost of tuition books? Absolutely. Yeah. So, students uh, with, with the ESC, we we have as an institution, we create what we call a cost of attendance, and the cost of attendance includes their cost to us, but also the cost of living for that's the highest part of it so when we say what's the cost of attendance for a student and we're mindful of tuition and fees and books we also have to realize they're paying rent or mortgage in the community child care transportation costs and so oftentimes when students are borrowing money it's for that cost of living expense i mean we have students who might be on scholarship here and their their scholarship is covering their their cost to jccc it's the but i still have costs of living okay thank you Randy, thank you very much. Yeah. Appreciate the detail. It's very helpful. Uh, I do not believe we have any old business. We have no, I'm sorry, were you finished with your report? Uh, no. Excuse me, Mr. Sorry. Chair. Yes, I, I'm finished. Hey, Jerry. There is an old business. Uh, last meeting, I asked for a financial report on what's in storage and stuff. So I just wanted to present that as part of old business. Um, so it sounds like a lot of the stuff that we have in storage is not um, of much, like we're not spending too much money in storage, so that's good. Iron Mountain um, is the offsite for microfish and data uh, tape storage. Costs about 25000 per year. This is per our disaster recovery practice. Um, storing excess systems furniture for the new buildings and things like that. Uh, very minimal cost. Uh, same with the art that's being stored also. Uh, any kind of insurance, things like that uh, seems uh, very well managed so I appreciate that um, it does bring up a, a question about the art that we get from donations that I would like to kind of maybe consider at some point uh, dr. Larson do we have a policy at this point so say if we get art we have the insurance rate and suddenly over years that art increases in value which would now we would increase the insurance and maintenance or safety especially if there's a spike do we have a trigger, trigger mechanism in there that would alert us to a sharp increase in value where we, that piece would be presented to the board so that we can approve that increase in cost, or is that an automatic increase that just happens? Do we I think I can respond to that. Okay. Each, uh, uh, not necessarily quarter, but there's a regular time where Kate Allen will bring to the management committee mm -hmm a list of all of that detailed art. We just had that report, as a matter of fact, uh, prior, prior to the election. It lists all of our art pieces. It lists the insurance we have on those items. So to answer your question, yes, there is a practice in place to make sure that when the pieces are donated, they're properly insured. And right. uh, we then also uh, have an obligation within the budget to make sure that we properly care for those. So I don't want to put Kate on the spot, but Kate, that was your kind of report. And uh, did I mess that up properly? <laughs> okay. So I don't think that's my question, but my question was more so once over time, say a piece increases dramatically right. in price, maybe starts out 17000 and now we're looking at $3 million. Correct. 
do we automatically just pay for that, or do we, as the board, approve In that? In fact, increase? we're currently having a special audit by some very high-end pieces by an outside uh, art appraiser. But that, again, comes through the management committee. Okay. And the answer is yes. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. The, prop the property pieces are reappraised periodically, and I'd, I'd suggest you talk to Tom Clayton, who's our insurance risk manager, who covers that along with Kate and Bruce and others. But yeah, we, I, think, I think we have a pretty robust policy to keep track of what we have and to value it and then insure it. Okay. He, he does an outstanding job. Yep. Faculty Association, Dr. Arjo. <coughs> Didn't mean to shock you. Okay. It's been a long time. No, no. Well, good evening, and as always, appreciate the chance to uh, address everybody. Um, it's a busy time of the semester. Um, just in general, uh, we just had a week of two interesting town halls about the proposed chair structure that Dr. McLeod hosted, and I think it's fair to say they're well attended. Faculty interest in that topic was pretty robust. I think it speaks to our willingness and desire to offer input and offer ideas and um, have a hand in developing uh, those sorts of things. Um, we're gearing up for negotiations, obviously. We had the first meeting um, last week. Um, on that note, before I forget, I do want to say that the first or the next general membership meeting of the FA is going to be postponed because of a scheduled negotiation session. So instead of being next Thursday, which it would normally be, it's going to be the following Tuesday. So that'll be the 27th at 3.30. Um, and as always, everybody's invited to attend. It's an open meeting. Um, I want to say a little bit about the bill that was referenced by Mr. Carter about free speech on campuses. Um, that came up a little bit in our discussion at Collegial Steering about academic freedom. That kind of piqued my interest, um, so I looked up the, the text of that bill. Um, I don't know what its likely fate is, um, so we'll just have to wait and see, but I do think it's kind of interesting and tells us something about the kind of broader moment we're living in that it would be introduced. Um, so I did some digging around, and I was able to find some actually identical language from that bill in bills introduced in other states, including Missouri, and one I think passed in uh, Virginia. Uh, so clearly this is being based on some model legislation that's being uh, worked up by, I feel really sure, two different think tanks. Uh, I mean, usually when that happens, there's a political agenda behind it, so I do think it's kind of interesting to try to tease out just why now is this uh, an issue. Um, I'd love to hear an official legal analysis of what this bill would do to a place like JCCC were it passed. My sense is not a whole lot. Most of it seems to just reaffirm First Amendment rights that people already enjoy. Uh, one of the most specific sections would outlaw free speech zones. Kind of the idea there, if you're going to do some political activism, you're restricted to a small part of the campus. And those have not fared well and challenged in court in any case. So again, it's kind of a why introduce this now kind of a question. Um, so if you read the whole thing, if you pay attention to what's going on in the academic world, it's not too hard to answer the question why now. This is clearly a response to uh, what's at least perceived to be problems about free speech on colleges and universities across the country. So these range from speakers being shouted down or interrupted because they're controversial. It includes uh, the perception, at least, that certain viewpoints are not welcome in classrooms and um, everything from uh, that to perceived bias among uh, faculty. Um, so we, in Kansas, I think, have been spared a lot of the turmoil that's happened in places like UC Berkeley and um, other places along those lines where this kind of stuff happens, Harvard, Princeton. Um, Middlebury College, there was an episode along those lines. Um, John Scamini College remains fairly calm as far as these sorts of high profile conflicts go. But I do think, as always, we need to be mindful of potential of these things happening um, and the perception, at least, that there is a, a bit of a clamping down on free speech, whether it's about viewpoints or whether so called political correctness or however you want to characterize it. Um, one part of it I did think was particularly interesting, and I think the faculty will be particularly um, want to be thinking about, I intend to introduce this at our next meeting, um, is a section that talks about the rights of students and the need to protect students' free speech rights when they come to a college or university. Um, there's a long-standing questions there. It's always kind of a tension-filled area. 
people come to JCCC or any other college, they come with their full range of constitutional protections. And of course, that includes free speech. On the other hand, the college empowers faculty to teach established curriculum, and that certainly means limiting discussion within classes to what's pertinent to the subject being taught and pertinent to the topic at hand and so on. So just a way of saying, from a faculty perspective, I find this to be a very curious and interesting piece of legislation. I guess it's curious even how it got introduced, which makes it even more interesting in some respects. So I expect we're gonna have a good discussion about it at our meeting next week, and uh, I might return to this topic. Thank you, any uh, questions of Dr. Arjo? Thank you, sir, appreciate it. Thanks for the detail on the bill, very helpful. Research Triangle, Trustee Lindstrom. Mr. Chairman, I have a very brief report. Uh, first of all, uh, sales tax receipts for the month of January for the 1 8 cent sales tax that goes to the Johnson County Education Research Triangle is, um, were $1,480,873.61, uh, which was 4% positive over the same time last year in 2017. And uh, we have not met since our last meeting here and do not meet again until Monday, May 7th, 2018 at 7.30 a.m. at the KU Edwards campus right up the road at 12600 South Guevara uh, in Overland Park and the public is invited. Okay. Thank you. Any questions of Trustee Lindstrom? Uh, Kansas Association of Community College Trustees uh, actually met today. Uh, we had our Phi Theta Kappa luncheon in Topeka, honoring students from all of the community colleges and some technical colleges. Uh, our two students uh, represented the college well and uh, receiving the, the uh, PTK award. The association met shortly thereafter in an abbreviated meeting. Uh, and then uh, we had to leave early. Uh, the Council of Presidents met as well. And uh, so I'm not sure what happened with the Council of Presidents and the trustees because we came back here. But the next meeting is June 1 and 2 at Kansas City, Kansas Community College. I think the attempt is to bring in a national speaker or two, probably Noah Brown from ACCT. And uh, we'll keep you posted on that particular meeting. Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. I Trustee. Think, uh, a year and a half will mark your 10-year anniversary. You'll get the gold. Yeah. Yeah, we give out cold KACCT uh, pets. Yeah. I've, been, uh, I've been here five years, and I made one, two, one, one KACCT meeting. I know when I looked at the registry, you know, we have to sign in. Uh, you've been going to those, I think, almost the entire tenure. You've been uh, here on the board. I want to thank you for representing us there and uh, allowing us to have a voice in an organization that we heavily help subsidize and protecting our interests there. And so I appreciate your work on uh, with KACCT. Be careful because testimony like that might position you to be the next uh, liaison. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. It's, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, I feel for some of these colleges and the challenges they have. <clears throat> and, um, and they do look to us for uh, leadership in a number of areas and to our staff uh, in a lot of areas. But thank you, uh, Trustee Cross. I appreciate that. Foundation, Trustee Ingram. Yes, the foundation is pleased to announce the Johnson County Community College Foundation has received a $2 million gift from Drs. David and Mary Zamorowski of Overland Park for the college's largest facilities project in its history. The Zamorowskis join other individuals and organizations in supporting the project's challenge lead gift of $10 million by the Sunderland Foundation. For nearly 20 years, the Zamorowskis have funded scholarships and initiatives at the college including international service learning projects to Mexico and Uganda, creation of the Healthcare Simulation Center, the college's first endowed professorship for healthcare education, annual underwriting for the National Healthcare Simulation Conference, and most recently, the donation of a patent. The Zamorowskis, who are both retired medical professionals, are making second careers out of helping the Kansas City community, particularly Johnson County Community College, with innovations that train professionals to answer the call for the healthcare needs of the future. The Foundation Board of Directors met Wednesday, January the 24th in the Rainier Center, and it was announced that John and Christy Stewart will be the 2018 co-chairs of Some Enchanted Evening. Nominations for the 2018 Johnson County End of the Year have been collected, and the selection committee meets soon. 
Uh, my fellow trustees, please mark your calendars for the next Foundation Member Social to be held Thursday, February 22nd at 4.30 p.m. in the BNSF Training Center located in the ITC building on campus. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Trustee. Those are terrific gifts to the Foundation. And uh, so. we certainly appreciate the uh, philanthropy of our community. Next item is a consent agenda. <clears throat> it's an item where we, the board deals with a number of routine items. Uh, trustees have an option to pull an item off that agenda if they so desire for further discussion. Uh, do I have a motion to pull any items? Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Is there a second? second. All in favor signify. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Yes. Opposed? Motion carries. Um, we are moving into an executive session this evening. I would like to entertain a motion to do such for the purpose of discussion pursuant to the Kansas Open Meetings Act, exception relating to consultation with the board's bargaining representation and employer-employee negotiations. This session will last 60 minutes. We will resume the open meeting in this same location following that period. No action will be taken during this session. We would like to invite Joe Sopchik, Barbara Larson, Becky Sintelwer, Jim Lane, Gerb Singh, Mickey McLeod, Randy Weber, Rachel Lears, Colleen Chandler, Tanya Wilson, and Melody Rail to join in this executive session. The session, uh, I'll ask for the motion. The session will begin at, uh, are nine minutes okay for a break? Uh, do you need more than nine minutes? 7.20, uh, do I have a motion? So move. Second. 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 We'll start uh, the executive session at 7.20. Thank you for your attendance. We have uh, come out of the executive session and uh, we'll need to extend. I would like to entertain a motion to go back into executive session for the purpose of discussions pursuant to the Kansas Open Meetings Act, ex exception relating to consul consultation with the board's bargaining, representation, and employer-employee negotiations. This session will last 30 minutes. We will resume the open meeting in this same location. No action will be taken during this session. We would like to invite Joe Sobchuk, Barbara Larson, Becky Senelvere, Jim Lane, Gerb Singh, Mickey McLeod, Randy Weber, Rachel Lears, Col Colleen Chandler, Tanya Wilson, and Melody Rail to join this executive session. Do I have a motion? I would move that, but do we, are we also not entitled to be in this for attorney-client purposes? I would like to include the attorney-client privilege in addition to the uh, bargaining unit negotiations. I'd make that motion. Second. We will uh, start at 821, uh, and we will uh, go 30 minutes. Thank you. Oh, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Yes. Aye. Motion carries. Please. We have come out of the executive session. We uh, took no action. And I will entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Yeah. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We are adjourned. <laughs>